I guess this Bible study is going to be called uh, the Trump card. There was a time I used to play uh, card games. Not so much gambling, but, you know, pass the time, I guess you could say. Playing the Trump card. Can Donald Trump make America great again? Well, let's turn to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. So he removes rulers and he sets up rulers. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and the, do and the light dwelleth with him. So the Lord removes rulers and he sets up new rulers. Why is Obama president? Because I believe he's God's judgment upon a wicked United States. Do you know that in 1963 and 1964, we had Bible reading and prayer in Jesus' name in the public schools all over America? Not the, not the private Christian schools, not the Catholic schools. No, no. The public schools. Then the so-called Supreme Court decided, well, you know, that's unconstitutional. We don't want that warping these young children's minds. We don't want the Ten Commandments hanging on the walls in the schools. I mean, kids might actually pay attention to thou shall not kill. We don't want that. Um, let's see, 1972 or 73, abortion was made legal. The So is abortion murder? You know, they got churches that are arguing about this. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, the Lord told Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet, a prophet unto the nations. There was a guy named Zacharias. He had a wife named Elizabeth. She was a cousin to a woman named Mary. Oh yeah, that Mary. And in Luke 1, chapter 13, we read the following. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Oh yeah, John the Baptist. Jesus said of all those born of women, there was not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist preached, repent. And you got a lot of preachers today say, oh, no, 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 don't, don't repent. You don't have to repent. That's optional. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, in the... Uh, I believe it's the, well, it's either the first or second chapter of the book of James. Well, we'll get back to that. And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt, and thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many, many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled 
and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even, even from his mother's womb. This kid came out of the mother's room and was already filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm sure there's people that will argue that. So, does God fill the Holy Ghost with unsaved fetuses, like the abortion, pro-abortion people? Would, uh, you know, fetuses, oh, they're not human beings. Really? That's why premature babies are able to be, you know, born and live and grow up? Hmm. Thou shalt not kill. America loves to kill. Loves to kill the unborn. Loves to kill the children of Ishmael, the Arabs over in the Middle East, all in the name of fighting terrorism. Did you know that about 15 to 25 percent of the Palestinians are Christians, and yet they're being slaughtered? Palestinians have no air force. They have no tanks, and yet they're being slaughtered by, you guess who? Palestinians virtually have no guns. They have no army, they have no navy, they have no air force, and yet they're the terrorists being slaughtered. And the great numbers of them, well, the ones that are still alive, They've lost probably 60, 70 percent of their population since 1948. If you don't know what happened in 1948 with the UN's creation, well, I believe God's gathering the tares for the harvest, but that's just my opinion. You know, I was living in the... Uh, close to the mountains of Colorado in Denver during the Bill Clinton presidency in the early 90s. And I remember there was a, uh, I used to go to the Denver Public Library to do research on uh, various things, you know, government conspiracies and what have you and Bible research, you know, this is before the internet, you know, and they had a lot of books. It was actually a Library of Congress depository, and they had a lot of really good books in the Denver Public Library. I was surprised. Books from, you know, a hundred years ago, and somebody filed a lawsuit and said, well, you know, um, uh, Denver is a government agency that we got to have separation of church and state. There shouldn't be Bibles in the library. So they removed all the Bibles from the Denver Public Library. Well, then I was doing some research on uh, the occult and Satanism or what have you. Well, guess what? They did have one Bible in the Denver Public Library. It was the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. His real name was Levy. You guessed it. He was kosher, very kosher, one of the so-called chosen ones. Yeah, he was Jewish. And uh, yeah, so the Church of Satan Bible, the, the Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan, that was in the Denver Public Library, but the Holy Bible, the King James, nope. That's, uh, we got to have separation of church and state. So, it's funny, you could have the Satanic Bible, but you can't have the Holy Bible. Second Chronicles 33 and verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. And he observed times and used enchantments. That's casting spells, for those of you who don't know what enchantments are. And used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit. That's ghosts. And dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. That's a male witch. And with wizards, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. 
God doesn't have many good things to say about uh, witchcraft. In Galatians 5 and verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication. Now what's the difference between adultery and fornication? Adultery is a married person having sex outside the marriage covenant, somebody other than their wife. Fornication, that's people that aren't married having sex. Uncleanness, and they're not talking about a messy room that your teenage kids leave laying around. Uncleanness is more of a, it's of a sexual nature, if you know what I mean. Lasciviousness, ooh, that's a good one. Lasciviousness is uh, called unbridled lust, excess outrageous so did you know that the Bible word for fornication is where we get the word for pornography it's a Greek word New Testament Greek word pornea that's where we get the word pornography Fornication. So, there's your Greek lesson for the today. Uh, let's see. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. What did Jesus say? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor as thyself. And what's the works of the flesh? Hatred. Variants, emulations, wrath. Wrath is an extreme anger. Strife, stirring up trouble between people. That's strife. Seditions, heresies. Oh yeah, we got a lot of heresies today in the church world especially, right? Envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings. If you don't know what reveling is, go to New Orleans during Mardi Gras. That's reveling. And such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So, let's take a look at some of these other things that we looked at. Witchcraft. Do you know that the word for witchcraft is pharmakia? That's where they get the word pharmacy, drugs. You know, the witch's brew, spells. Uh, so, what about uh, variants? Well, in Matthew 10 and verse 35, Jesus said, For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. See, Jesus was going to set us at variance against the world. Oh yeah, that's how that works. It basically means a quarrel or wrangling, contention, debate. Okay? Uh, that particular word is translated as strife, debate, contention, and variance. So, what is emulations? Well, let's take a look. An envious and contentious rivalry, jealousy. In other words, you're not us, but the world is fighting against the Lord. 
the fierceness of indignation. So that's what emulation means. And what is sedition? Sedition is treason. When Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, that was sedition. He had spent years with Jesus, had watched all the miracles, had listened to him. He was even the treasurer. He held the money bag. That was probably the only thing keeping Judas around because he was stealing from the money bag. But when he turned in Jesus for the 30 pieces of silver, that was sedition. And what are heresies? I would hope you know what that is. That's Heresies are teaching gross error from the Bible. Uh, for example, Judaism claims, well, it, there's two different sets of rabbis that I know of. The one rabbi says that uh, Mary, the mother, well, the, the, the wife of Joseph, got pregnant by a Roman soldier named a Pantera, and that she was a prostitute. And then there's the other Jewish rabbi that says that uh, Mary got pregnant when she had sex with a demon or the devil called Samael, which some attribute to Satan. So that to me is a heresy. And when I hear Hebrew roots people saying that we should, uh, well, they would call me telling you that it's anti-Semitism. Really? So you can call, so a Jew can call Jesus the son of a whore or the son of a, a the devil and me exposing that, and defending against that is anti-Semitism. Okay. Sounds like they don't love Jesus very much, do they? Oh, that's right. They don't call him Jesus. They call him Yeshua, which doesn't appear in the New Testament anyways. And then you got the sacred name people, Yahuwah, Yahuwabai, Yahweh, uh, Yeshua. Actually, I, I when you read the book of Joshua, I believe that is the correct pronunciation. You got a whole bunch of Eastern European Jews that, well, they call themselves Jews, they speak Yiddish, and Yiddish is not Hebrew. You can hand any Yiddish-speaking so-called Jew the Old Testament in Hebrew, and they can't read it. They can't read it. Oh, yeah, they, they memorize something from the scrolls when they have their little uh, bar mitzvahs, and, you know, but they can't. They don't know Bible Hebrew. They don't know it. They want us to think they do, because they want us to think they're the people of the book. But they're converts. And if you mention the Chazars, K-H-A-Z-A-R, put an S on the end, um, Hebrew Roots people will go absolutely nut and say, nuts and say, well, you know, that's, that's fake. That's, that's not true. The Chazar theory is not, that's not true. That's anti-Semitism again. But the thing is, the Jewish Encyclopedia has an entire article on the conversion of the Chazars to the, well, the faith of the Pharisees, not the faith of Abraham, not the Bible, not the Torah. They have their faith in the Talmud. So, and I have to apologize. I've been wanting to finish up the uh, King David series. I've been wanting to finish up the Iron Kingdom series, but I've been uh, busy moving around. I'm wanting to get out of South Florida. This place is cursed. I live in the third largest concentration of Jews, so-called, in the United States, and there are so many Kabbalah centers. I pass a couple of Kabbalah, I pass Kabbalah centers all the time, and Kabbalah 
Kabbalah is uh, K-A-B-B-A-L-A-H. Kabbalah is basically witchcraft masquerading as Judaism. And South Florida's cursed. So I want to get out of here. And I've been having uh, problems with work. Um, I spent 10 years at work working full-time on the night shift. I finally get off the night shift after 10 years, and they just told me uh, two days ago I'm going back on the night shift. And, you know, it's extremely hard to work full-time and, and working horrible hours and do these Bible studies. I... I love doing the Bible studies, but I'm not quite 62 yet. I'm 60. I've got about another 14, 15 months, 16 months before I'm uh, eligible to take Social Security early. If it's still around, it may not. And I'm going to have a small pension from the city that I work for. Um... I've only been there 10 years, so I'm only going to get 30% of my pay. And then they're going to tax that, so, you know, what can I tell you? But uh, I want to finish the Iron Kingdom series. Now, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, I've never, I have never asked for money in the past. I've been doing this for years. Matter of fact, I started doing uh, radio shows and writing for Christian newspapers oh, back in the when? Oh, I don't know. Early 2000, 2000, 2001. I actually had a radio show. And I've told the story before, I'm sure. But uh, I did a show on radio, sh Christian radio show on Halloween Satanism the Occult, and a couple days after the show came out, um, my back gave out. I couldn't work anymore. I used to drive a truck, couldn't work, lost my job. I guess the Lord was getting me out of that job, and uh, I applied for disability. The company was self-insured. They said no. I said, okay, you don't want to give me disability. How about short-term disability? They said no. Then I applied for workers' comp. They said no. Well, you know, when you apply for workers' comp, they say, well, you applied for disability. So this is not a workers' comp case. And then when I applied for disability, they said, well, you applied for workers' comp, so this is not a disability case. So basically I had to get a lawyer, and, you know, they gave me, I was out of work for, I don't know, half a year and they gave me like ten twelve thousand dollars so whoop de doo right but you know it's amazing I uh, never went hungry the Lord only promises you two things in this life in first Timothy 6 8 Paul writes and having food and raiment let us be therewith content you know, that's the only two things the Lord offers you, is food and payment. That's basically clothing. So. All right, so we learned that the world is into adultery, fornication, sexual uncleanness, witchcraft, hatred, strife, seditions, heresies. Hmm. Envyings, Galatians 5.21, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And you got a heresy going around now that all you got to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So it doesn't matter if you're into idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, murders, drunkenness. 
Paul says they're not going to, these people are, that live such lives, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. But you got people now that teach that repentance is optional. That you don't have to turn away from these things. Just, you know, if you're a hit man for the mafia, just believe on Jesus and keep your day job or night job or whatever. What's a hit man for the mafia? Is that a night job? I don't know. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So if you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and Against such there is no law. So, I ought to tell these Hebrew roots Torah keepers that they need the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Because they don't need the law. They don't need to keep the law. They need love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what they need, not the law. Verse 24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Very important. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Very important. So, repentance, optional. I've done an entire Bible study on this, so I'm just going to kind of take a look real quick. Remember John the Baptist? Oh, yeah. Matthew 3, chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment, his clothing, had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts, and wild honey. How would you like to eat locusts? You know what a locust is? It's just a big old grasshopper. How would you like to be eating grasshoppers and honey? Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. There's people now that teach you all you got to do is believe in Jesus and keep your sins. But these people were confessing their sins. And repenting means to turn away from your sins. Verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, those are Jews. Pharisees are Jews and Sadducees are Jews. They're just two different denominations of Jews. Sort of like Baptist and Pentecostals, I guess. I don't see much difference between the Baptists and the Pentecostals, but um, with them, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But but when he, John, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, "O oh, chosen people of God." No, he didn't say that. He said, "O oh, generation of vipers." Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And if you don't know what fruits are, he's not talking about apple trees and pears and dates. He's talking about their works. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Oh yeah, repentance is optional, right? 
who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Ooh. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose span is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In Matthew 11:11, 11, 11, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Um... I'll tell you what, how's that for uh, a reference when Jesus says, you know, among those that are born of women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So, how about Luke chapter 7, verse 28, Jesus, for I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Boy, that's, that's, that's a testimony. And John said to repent. Do you know John the Baptist would not be, would not be welcome in the Baptist churches today? I mean, if he told the Jews, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, that they were children of vipers, they would call him anti-Semitic and kick him out of the, uh, the 501c3 church, wouldn't they? Well, it's not a church. It's a business. But it's got church in the name, you know, First Baptist Church. But it's actually a business. That's what 501c3 is. It's incorporation. You know, um, Grace Baptist Church, whatever. It's a business masquerading as a church. And it's got church in the name. Just like you got Federal Express. Federal Express, is that part of the U.S. government? Uh, no, but it's got federal in the name. There's a company called USA Truck. It's a trucking company, USA Trucking. You think that's part of the USA? Well, they're in the USA, but they're not part of the USA. So names, what does that mean? Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, the Bible was banned in public schools. The Bible was banned in the public library in Denver. And yet the public schools are having Harry Potter, a guy that wants to be a wizard, a saucer, learning witchcraft as required reading in high school. I've had parents tell me that their kids were required reading of Harry Potter, a book on Satanism and the occult, and yet the Bible's banned. You think America's going to repent? I don't think so. Mark 1 and verse 5, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Mark 6, 12, and they went out and preached that men should repent. Jesus speaking, Luke 13, 3 and, verse, and verses 5. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise 
perish. And people tell you, oh, you don't need to repent. Don't worry about it. Just believe on the Lord Jesus. Well, Jesus said repent. Oh, well, you got to repent of your unbelief. Oh, okay. But in Luke 17, 3, Jesus said, Take heed to yourself. If thy brother trespass, that's sin, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. What does that mean, if he repent? If he believes? Well, I guess you could say, yeah, if he believes. Because if, if he believes he wronged you, he's going to turn away from wronging you, right? Verse 4. And if he repents again, if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Yeshua. No. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter said, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, not Yeshua. Are, are, are Hebrews people trying to keep people from being saved by using Yeshua? I wonder... I, you know, I really, really wonder. In Isaiah 7.14, we read, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's with an I. I-M-M-A-N-U-E-L. A virgin. You know, the modern Bibles don't say virgin. They say young woman. So I guess if a 12-year-old girl gets pregnant, it's a miracle, right? A sign from heaven. A 12-year-old girl got pregnant. Oh, yeah. No, that's not what it means. Mary was a virgin. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So where do we see this in the New Testament? Well, let's take a look. In Matthew 1, verse 23, we read the fulfillment of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Yeshua, no, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. And that's Emmanuel with an E. That's just the Greek rendering of the Hebrew word Emmanuel. How come the Hebrew roots people don't call him Emmanuel? Why do they call him Yeshua, a word that doesn't appear anywhere in the Greek New Testament? You know, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? And why do they call him Yeshua? I mean, it's Joshua. Joshua, not Yeshua. Sometimes I think these people mispronounce words just to try to hide things from the Christians so they don't make the connection. Acts 2, uh, 3.19 Repent ye therefore and be converted. Repent and ye therefore and be converted that your sins, that your unbelief may be blotted out? No. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing 
shall come from the presence of the Lord. Acts 8.22, repent therefore of your unbelief. No. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 17.30 And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent. Hmm. Repent of our unbelief? How come he's all, they're mentioning sin and wickedness? I guess you could say unbelief is sin and wickedness. You know, it kind of goes hand in hand, but Acts 26, 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Now here, here here's an interesting verse. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Let me see where I'm going to start here. Well, let's start at chapter 1. So, are we supposed to repent of our unbelief? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. So, here he is, you got an angel for the church of the church at Ephesus, a Greek city in Greece. All right, so this is a church. So the angel for the church at Ephesus. Okay, believers, right? Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And there are deceivers that are going to tell you that that's talking about Paul. Wrong. Verse 3. And has borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake, and for my name's sake, not Yeshua, and for my name's sake hath labored, hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. What was the church's first love? Christ, the Lord. Okay? Because thou hast left thy first love. Verse 5. Now remember, they're talking about a church in Ephesus. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art Fallen and repent. Repent of what? Their unbelief? How can a church repent of their unbelief? And yet there are deceivers that will tell you that, well, that's what they're talking about, repenting of their unbelief. Well, this is a church that believes. How can a church that believes repent of their unbelief? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Where did they fall from? And repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But thou hast... But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Hmm. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So, repenting just of unbelief, I don't think so. Heresy, right, people? And if you really want to nail the, the coffin shut, 
Revelation 2, chapter 22. Behold, I will cast her into, into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their unbelief. No. Except they repent of their deeds. Okay? They're not talking about a land deed. They're talking about the things they do. Revelation 3, 3. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation 3.19 As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. If the Lord loves you, he's going to rebuke, uh, rebuke you and chasten you. He's going to spank you. I am a perfect living example of that you know if any of you knew my life oh and all the things i had done you know just just remember something god doesn't grade on a curve god's not gonna you know hold you up against bob walker and 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 you know compare your life against mine that's not how it works your, your life's going to be compared against jesus and uh, I've been chastened. I've been spanked many times recently. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, if you're not rebuked, if you're not chastened, the Bible says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, it says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Do you know what a reprobate is? Go to San Francisco and look at all the sodomites. Those are reprobates. And if you don't believe me, read Romans 1. When God... Now, I'm not saying a, a sodomite cannot be saved, but I tell you what, 0.1% maybe, 0.01% maybe, I don't know. I don't make those decisions, but I tell you what, God will turn you over to a reprobate mind. When you love your sin more than you love the Lord, he will turn you over to a reprobate mind. And when you do, your conscience is seared with a hot iron. Yeah, read Romans 1, chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Oh, yeah. Do you know that God will... Oof. God will sear your conscience with a hot iron. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Oh yeah, God will most certainly Oh, it's just, when you love your sin more than the Lord, he'll let you have your sin all you want. And people say they don't, you know, oh, well, they don't know the gospel. We got to preach to them, right? Well, Romans chapter 1 and verse 32. Who, knowing the judgment of God, who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Oh, yeah. So, just repent of your unbelief, or do we have to have works? Or do works save us? Or are works proof that you're grafted into the tree and producing fruit? I mean, let's face it, 
What good is an apple tree that produces no apples? I mean, why even have it in the yard? Get rid of it. Put up an apple tree that produces apples so that at least you could have apples to eat, right? I mean, what good is a tree that doesn't produce any fruit? And Jesus used that example a lot. James chapter 2, verse 14. Do work save us? No, absolutely not. But James, James is an interesting guy. It's a very good book. It's, I call it the, the book of practical living. James had a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph. And uh, he grew up with a guy named Jesus. So you better believe this guy knows what he's talking about, okay? James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith? Oh yes, I have faith. For what doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, middle of winter, a brother or sister's got no food and they got no clothes. It's winter and they're about ready to freeze to death and starve to death. Right? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Oh, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? You know, you got five coats in your closet and you got a big pot of stew on the on the oven, on the stove. And you'd rather, you got five coats and four of them you haven't worn in three years. You're not going to reach in your closet, and grab a coat and hand it to this person. And you'd rather throw food away after the family's eaten than give it to somebody that's starving to death. And you call that faith? Do you know there's restaurants uh, like uh, Red Lobster? They're owned by a company. You know, they, they throw the food away. They won't even feed their employees. I quit going there. I Personally, I hope they go out of business. I mean, can you imagine that? You work for a restaurant and the, the company would rather throw food food away in the garbage then let the employees have it really boy that that breeds loyalty huh and one of you say unto them depart in peace be warm and filled notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body what doth it profit it profits nothing even so faith Verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. What you do is proof of what you believe. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Oh yeah, the devil believes in God. But are his works, what are his works? His works are evil. And if you don't do better works than what the devil does, well, what can I tell you? Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Yeah, works are not going to save you. On Judgment Day, you're not going to go to the Lord and say, Well, you know, Lord, I gave a coat to that person and I fed them with a stew that was on the, the oven, you know, the stove. And, 
You know, that's why you should let me in heaven. No, 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 no. You're going to say, I, because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and his works, his sinless life, his virgin birth, And the Lord will look and say, well, what you did reflects what you believed. Joy, peace, love. Fruits of the Spirit, people. Didn't we read that? Galatians 5.22 again. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and, un, and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. You know, think about that. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Reprove means to expose them. So when you have these charismatics on TBN, and they tell you that people that expose their wickedness are stirring up strife, no, they're exposing the unfruitful works of darkness. And we're supposed to reprove them. You know? And if people want to have fellowship and send Benny Hinn and uh, Copeland and Hagen and all those guys, I don't even know, Sid Roth and all those wonderful heretics, if, in my opinion, they want to make them rich and so that they can fly around and Creflo Dollar, Creflo send me a dollar uh, so they can fly around on their Learjets, well, hey, may their God bless them. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is like, is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Didn't Jesus say he was the light of the world in John 8, 12? Oh, yeah. Arise from the dead, spiritually dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Oh, yeah, we live in some really evil days today. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? We're going to get to that in a second. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Yeshua, no, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one another, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of, the, of God. And boy, I tell you what, here's the most hated verse in the Bible by women. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. But the women that, uh, when I used to do perform weddings, women's always want me to skip what I just read, but they'd want me to read this next part. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives. 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Husbands, love your wives. You know, that's a commandment that Paul gave. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, Christ died for the church. Husbands should do the same for their wives, right? But <laughs> when I used to go to weddings, the women would always want me to read this verse. And I told them, uh, yeah, but I'm going to read the verses before that too. It was a package deal, I told them. It's a package deal. I refused to read just that word. Just the, you know, husbands love your wives. I, I read the verses before that too. I says, if you're going to read one, you're going to read it all. I ain't skipping around, kiddo. And, uh, you know, I had a few that actually told me, well, then forget it. Of course, I would tell them 15 minutes before the wedding. They couldn't find anybody else. Yeah, I was a real uh, stinker sometimes, you know. Yeah. Husbands are supposed to love their wives, but the wife is supposed to revere the husband as the head of the church and the head of the wife. So think about that. Well, I've been ranting and raving for an hour. And, you know, I want to finish the David series, and I want to finish the um, Iron Kingdom series. Uh, I've been moving around and trying to get stuff taken care of, and it's been a, it's been a really bad year. And, uh, like I said, I've been having problems at work, and it's really very, very difficult working the night shift but uh, right now I'm eligible for my small pension like I've mentioned and I know that one day maybe in the near future there's not going to be any money cash there's going to be the mark of the beast I believe the Lord showed me it was going to be some type of a microchip. I don't, I, I'm not saying I'm a prophet of the Lord. I'm not saying that at all. I believe that's what the Lord showed me in 1990 or so. I could be wrong, but I believe it's going to be something like that. They're already putting chips in the cards, the, the ATM and debit cards and credit cards. And all I got to do is take it out of the card that can be stolen or lost and put it in your hand and put your financial information on there and put your government identification information on there, you know, your birth certificate, driver's license, uh, social security, your bank account, you know, uh, you wouldn't be able to buy or sell without it, you know, it, it's... I mean, the mark of the beast, it's, you know, with computers, they couldn't have implemented this 50 years ago. It's 100 years ago, absolutely not. No way. Even 50 years ago, they couldn't have implemented this. But with today's technology and the smartphones, oh yeah, they could do it. And I know that one day, there'll be no more cash. Christians will have to find a way to live without money and most people are so hooked up into this pre-trib rapture thing they they don't even think they're going to see the mark of the beast so they're going to take the mark of the beast because one they don't believe they're going to be here for it but they are and two their pastors who work for the 501c3 the corporations their business their the business that calls itself a church, they want to keep that money coming in, so they're going to tell their members, well, you know, this isn't the mark of the beast. We're not going to be here. We're going to be raptured out of here before this happens. You know, and, and how can you pay your tithe to the church if you don't take this um, thing in your right hand or in your forehead? You know? So trust me, the great majority of people 
are going to take the mark of the beast. Even people that proclaim faith in Christ, you watch. Uh, what's his name? Oh, boy, let me find it real quick. Yeah, that husky guy that calls himself, I think it's Brian Dernlin or Denlin or whatever his name is. Uh, you can find him on, uh, he's Husky394XP on YouTube. You know, he's got a video called The False God of Post-Trib Christians. If you, to, according to him, if you believe that Christians are going to be here for the tribulation, you worship a false god. Well, I guess Jesus is a false god because in Matthew 24, Jesus said, after the tribulation. Oh yeah, people, trust me. I, you know, people say, well, you know, the pre-trib rapture, it's not that important of a thing. You know what? This Brian guy, he'll, I, I don't even, I think he works for Satan. I really, really do. I mean, who in their right mind is going to say, well, if you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, you've got, you're, you're worshiping a false god. I mean, this guy is evil. And yet he's got tens of thousands, I don't know, ten, tens of thousands of views on his, on his site. I mean, it's just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, he's got over 17,000 views on one video alone. And he's got, um, he's got 17,000 subscribers. I mean, unbelievable. You know? And he says, if you don't, uh, if you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, you you've got a false Jesus. Seriously. So I guess one of us has a false Jesus, right? Well, this is the thing, people. I want to get out of South Florida, and I want to start doing Bible studies full time. And. I don't, I honestly think the Lord's hand is in this work. I've got a boss. He wasn't even born. <laughs> the uh, operations manager and, and, my, and my chief, my superintendent of where I work, his boss, my boss and his boss, neither one of them were born in America. Do you know that? Neither one of them were born in America. They became U.S. citizens, but this is what my city does. They, they don't even want to hire American citizens, if they can help it. But I feel like I'm trying to, they're being, I'm being forced out. I'm going to go back to midnight shift, and it's really hard working midnight shift, you know, when you're 60-something years old. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe it's time to, to re retire, get out of here. Start devoting full time to ministry. You know, there's going to be a time when there is no money. I don't want to be here in South Florida with all these Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah Kabbalists, whatever they call them, Kabbalah practitioners. This is the third largest Kabbalah center in the United States after New York and Los Angeles. I mean, it's mainstream. They get on TV and say, come visit our Kabbalah center and put ads in the newspaper and the stupid Christians are blind. They don't even know what it is. It's witchcraft masquerading as Satanism. But my point is, I think it's time for me to get out of here and retire. Now, I've got two-something thousand subscribers. If just 10% of you put it in your heart, 200 of you would send me five bucks a month. I could easily retire and devote myself full time to Bible Bible studies. You know, I've never asked for money in the past. But uh, I'm beginning to think maybe, you know, I don't know. I if if a few of you would like to, you know, send me a couple comments. Maybe I'll set up a GoFundMe or a PayPal account or whatever. Um, I'm also going to start another channel on uh, wilderness 
stuff, wilderness survival? Because reason being, well, let's take a look. In Revelation 12 and verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now who's the woman? I think the woman's the bride, the church. And of course people will say, oh, well that's Israel, that's the Jews. Well, let's take a look at Revelation 12 and verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now, there are people that'll tell you, oh, well, that's the Jews. That's not, that's not the Christians. You know, and then they try to make it out to be two different houses. Well, you got Israel, the Jews, and then you got the church, and they're not the same. I've heard that garbage. Turn to Galatians 3.26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So is there a dual house thing? Uh, no. You're either in Christ or you're out of Christ. Okay, I think the church is the woman. And I think she's going to be here for the tribulation. God's going to use the tribulation to purify his bride. Right now, people love their bass boats. They love their new cars. They love their big houses. How much do you think people would love the Lord if they have to live without money or take the mark of the beast to survive? What do you think? The Lord only promises you food and clothing, raiment. That's it. You think people are going to want to give up their cars, their jewelry, their homes, their private schools, their... No. Their flat screen TVs, their smartphones? I don't think so. Personally, I think the woman is the bride of Christ, the church. And I believe that God's going to use the tribulation to purify his bride. And what the pre-tribbers will lie about and try to make you misunderstand is they're going to try to trick you into thinking that the judgments of God, the bowls, the, the vials, that when the Lord pours out his wrath against the earth, he wants you to think that, oh, well, God's doing this against the church and, and we're not subject to God's wrath. But the thing is, they're correct, but what they're trying to do is trick you into thinking that God's going to be the one killing the Christians in the tribulation. And that's not true. It's going to be Satan's people killing people in the tribulation. I mean, read Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. So let's read that again. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ 
a thousand years. And pre-tribbers want you to think, ah, oh, well, this is God's wrath. No, this is not God's wrath. No, it's not. They're idiots. Personally, like that Brian Husky guy that says, well, post-trib Christians have a different God than him. I agree with him 100%. We do have a different God. In Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth. Wroth is angry. Wroth is a old English word, you know, wrath. Wrath means anger. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. Do the Jews have the testimony of Jesus Christ? Uh, no, because if they did, they wouldn't be Jews. They'd be Christians, right? So the dragon's going to be angry with the woman and went to make war. What happens in a war? People get killed. Okay, that's what happens in wars. Okay, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. See, there's only going to be a remnant which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what commandments are we supposed to keep? Somebody asked Jesus in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36, he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So that's basically fulfilling the law. We don't need Torah keeping. I mean, if you want to keep the Sabbath, that's great. But is it a condition for salvation? I don't think so. So I'm going to, I was in the army and uh, the Boy Scouts and, you know, did some camping when I was younger, boy, a long time ago. But I know a lot about um, wilderness type survival skills and what have you. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to move to a more rural, rural area. But even here in South Florida, I can do uh, reviews of some uh, like camping, survival type stuff. I have a lot of knowledge that I picked up over the years. You know, that's it doesn't make you smart when you're older, you know, but you learn things, you know. I mean, let's face it, when you're 12 years old, what do you know? And then when you're 30, hopefully you've tripled your knowledge than, you know, when you were 12, you know. But uh, 60 years, I've I've learned some things, so... I think I'm going to start a uh, camping survival type channel where I review equipment and uh, what have you, and people will be able to buy things. Uh, we'll see what happens. But like I was saying, you know, I, I've never asked for money in the past, and I've been doing this for years. I mean, I've been doing ministry stuff for probably 15 years now, on and off. Uh, on the internet, on the radio, in newspapers, and now on YouTube. And my YouTube channel's been up, I think, about four years now. I'm not sure. I'll have to check it out. But it, it's been over three years. And like I said, I've never asked for money in the past. So, you know, 2,000 subscribers, if 10% of you would send me five bucks a month, I could retire, quit my job, retire, and devote myself full time into the ministry. I know a lot of you are not well off financially either. Some of you are on disability. You're older, you know. Um, I drive an older, well, not real old, but a Honda Civic. I don't have a Mercedes. I don't have a Cadillac. Um, I do not have a Learjet. Um, 
You know, I don't have a plane. Uh, so, you know, I wear t-shirts, blue jeans on my days off. I've got a couple suits for weddings and funerals that I used to do, but, uh, you know, I, I, and I live in a home in South Florida that's, uh, $100,000, and the median price for homes down here is like $150,000, so, you know, I'm living in a modest, lower middle class neighborhood, but I need to get out of here. So, you know, if 10% of you want to send me five bucks a month, let me know what you think. Um, maybe I'll set up a PayPal account, a, a GoFundMe or whatever. Um, I don't trust a lot of these places, you know. Uh, if you do decide you want to help fund me or whatever, that'd be great. Um, I would buy like uh, one of those Visa, what are they, Visa gift cards or whatever. It's like a credit card, but you just put money on it. This way, if when you put money on it and you spend it or send it or whatever, uh, people don't, these GoFundMe accounts or the PayPal, they don't have access to your bank account. You know, it can't get hacked. I mean, if you buy one of these Visa gift cards, you know, you put 20 bucks on it. I mean, that's all you can lose is 20 bucks. So, just my suggestion, you know. But, uh, you know, like I say, I've never asked for money in the past. But, you know, I just don't think this uh, job of mine is going to work out. You know, I worked night shift for 10 years. I've been trying to do the Bible studies and what have you. And it's been hard. So... What can I tell you? All right, well, in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is the Christ. In his precious name, amen. This is Chaplain Bob signing off. Thank you for listening. Amen.